my name is uh, Ken Byrne. I'm 50 years old. Today's date is uh, May 10th, 2008. I'm in Sacramento, California. Um, my story is a story of survival for my uh, great-grandmother, whose name was Sakura, Native American from the Lost Coast of California. So I want to start with an article from the, uh, the Weekly Humboldt Times in Eureka, California, Saturday, March 3rd, 1860, written by Brett, Part, Brett Hart, who was run out of Humboldt County for writing this article. Rancheria on Indian Island was attacked on Saturday night by an unknown party of men. With the exception of three or four that escaped, the whole tribe, with many Mad River Indians stopping there, were killed. It may well be imagined that the unexpected attack on the diggers so near town, accompanied with such a terrible, indiscriminate slaughter, produced considerable excitement here on Sunday evening. In the midst of it, news reached town that the ranches on South Beach had also been attacked the same night. The whole number of diggers there exterminated. Since then, it was reported that a considerable number of Indians on the Eel River were killed the same night. The ranches at Bucksport and on Eel River were not disturbed, as there were only squaws and children at these places except two old bucks. It would seem that design at first was only to kill the bucks. The killing appears to have been principally with knives and hatchets or axes. The whole number killed at the different places on Saturday night cannot fall below 150, including bucks, squaws, and children. These simultaneous attacks at different points show clearly that this new plan of operations against the Indians has been adopted by a large number of people in this county, and they act in concert. It is generally supposed that the sufferers from Indian depredations in the Bald Hills on Eel River and lower part of the county are at the bottom of it. There are men in this county, as there may be elsewhere, where the government allows these degraded diggers to roam at large and plunder and murder without restraint, who have become perfectly desperate, and we have here some of the fruits of that desperation. They have friends or relatives cruelly and s savagely butchered, their homes made desolate, and their hard-earned properties destroyed by these sneaking, cowardly wretches. And when an attempt is made to hunt them from their hiding places in the mountains to administer merited punishment upon them, they escape to the friendly ranches on the coast for protection. When appeals are made for aid in protecting their lives and property, they are met by contumely and reproach. Their brethren in other parts of the state, many of whom approve of hanging up white men without due process of law for such less crimes than these diggers have committed, heap ridicule upon them and shed crocodile tears over the poor Indians. Smarting under these great and grievous wrongs, we are prepared to overlook much that would otherwise be unjustifiable but we cannot approve of the indiscriminate slaughter of helpless children and defenseless squaws. We cannot conceive of any excuse for such killing unless it be accidental, and will suppose that anyone in his sober moments will attempt to justify such a thing. If in defense of your property and your all it becomes necessary to break up these hiding places of your mountain enemies, so be it. But for heaven's sakes, in doing so, do not forget of what race you belong. We say this in all kindness and sincerely hope that such an indiscriminate slaughter may never occur again in this county. I have here another document that's called The Ancient Indian Carvings Rediscovered, Carvings Lost for 80 Years. My mother showed me this article out of a newspaper. And she said these carvings were never lost. No one just ever asked where they were. It's uh, by Carl Nolte, Chronicle Staff Writer. State forester inspecting a timber cutting project last month rediscovered some rock carvings. 
left by the people who were among the earliest residents of California. The site on the remote stretch of the Eel River is northwestern California. It contains mysterious drawings from separate Indian cultures, some possibly dating from 2,000 years before Christ. The drawings, technically called petroglyphs, had been discovered by scientists once before and because of a mistaken description had been lost for 80 years. Spotting the drawings again, said California Department of Forestry archaeologist Dan Foster, is a major find, the find of the year. The discovery of the petroglyphs reads a bit like a backwoods adventure story, but it also gives a glimpse into the mystery of the little un understood past of California, where ancient, ancient Indian cultures flourished and disappeared, leaving a few, only a few traces. The carvings were found by forester Dan Dave Drennan, who was checking on a timber cutting project last month in the area. Drennan, who was training in archaeology, noticed a flat area across the river from his project and thought it might contain Indian artifacts. He waded across the river, which was at its lowest point of the year, and was astonished to discover rocks covered with strange whirls squiggles, lines, and circles. He immediately recognized the carvings as those discovered by a civil engineer making a railroad survey in 1913. The location was later misidentified on state archaeological maps, and the ca country is so far off the beaten track that the carvings were not found again for 80 years. When What Drennan had found, said archaeologist, archaeologist Foster, were carvings from four levels of Indian culture. The latest was from the Wailaki people, who lived in about 95 named villages along the Eel River for about 1,000 years until they were driven out by white Americans in 1862. Foster said there were three other cultures represented. One was related to the Wailaki, but the other two were much earlier people mysterious groups referred to California Indians in historic times as the Old Ones. Foster said, no one knows who these people were or what language they spoke. We have no idea, said Foster. They are part of an ancient culture we know only almost nothing about. They lived along the Eel River in two cycles. Some were hunters and some lived on the ridge tops. Unlike the river people who came later and harvested the salmon and spawned in the river and game in the hills, including bears. Some of the carvings Foster thinks go back 2,000 years. Some he feels are much older, perhaps 4,000 years old, which would date them from the time of the flourishing of ancient Egypt. Foster thinks the swirls and markings, some of which resemble snakes and circles, are the work of shamans who were thought to possess magic power. The Indians of those times, said Foster, saw no difference between the physical world and the spirit world. The site on the Eel River may have been close to the border between the two worlds. They may have thought these rocks had power and were linked to the spirit world. The Wailaki people, for example, believed that shamans could see and communicate with the Kanage, also known as the Night Traveler, who was the creator of the world. The shaman could also explain droughts and changes in the spawning habits of the salmon, both major forces in the lives of the people before the whites came. Such beliefs were particularly appropriate in the misty and rainy Upper, Real, River, upper Eel River country, which is still so far from mainstream California but is penetrated only by a short line railroad and a dirt roads. The meanings of the ancient markings is apparently lost forever, and even the rep recent marks, less than 200 years old, are a mystery, because the white Americans practically exterminated the Wailaki people in the summers of 1861 and 1862, according to the Smithsonian Institute. That would be under the presidential guide of Abraham Lincoln. This is a story from the... Uh, Historical Society of Hayfork. As Gracie McKibben was interviewed about her recollection of early Norel Palm 
She told how the Indians used to camp. They moved to the source of their food as the seasons changed. They went to Happy Valley for a certain fishing, a certain type of manzanita berry, and to the South Fork for fishing. The Nor El Muck when went with the Indians of Salt Flat to a spot where Grass Valley Creek goes into Trinity River. There they built a woven fish trap which was made more effective by rolling a pole covered with willows through the water to scare the fish and drive them towards the fish trap. They dried raspberries just as Jim Ty did as a boy by placing them on a scraped pine bark. Gracie has two distinctions, the first being that she was the only full-blooded Norelk muck still living in Norrell Palm today. The second is that she is a descendant of Bob Tuis. This name may mean nothing to non-Indians. To the Numsos, he was the sole survivor of the Natural Bridge Massacre. Bob Tuis was Gracie's great uncle on her father's side. It is always told that there were only one survivor. Today, according to books, there were one or two. Some non-Indians talk of three survivors. Gracie says she was told that there were about 300 Indians living at the Natural Bridge at the time of the massacre. A small band of renegade Indians came through the county, doing harm to whites and Indians alike. They killed horses and mules belonging to some of the white people, even feasting on the mules. This triggered an attack because the white people thought the Indians living near the Natural Bridge were responsible. All these Indians were wiped out before any one of the white men knew that an injustice had been done. Those 300 Indians were buried near the scene of that bloody massacre. Still today, the Indians must protect their burial grounds against souvenir hunters. Today, the Natural Bridge Massacre is a painful memory to all who know the story. The Indians seldom talk about it. Jim Ty, though he spent many years in Hayfork, as a young man, never saw the natural bridge until he was in his early 70s. Then his only reason for going was to attend a historical society picnic there. The Indians in some conflicts were guilty, but in this case, those who paid with their lives were innocent. This is a document from the United States Department of Interior, Office of Interior Affairs, Field Service. Ukiah, California, June 21st, 1937. Mr. Roy Nash, Superintendent, Sacramento Agency. Dear Mr. Nash, Regarding my telephone message of this afternoon regarding Amy Stilwell of Covalo, I was called today by Wani Burt, Chairman of the Mendocino Grand Jury, to tell what I could regarding this case. The history is as follows. Mrs. Stilwell was taken sick out at Redwood Valley Drive, uh, Redwood Valley. Dr. Abbott was called to see her, his diagnosis, her condition as a surgical abdomen, the true cause to be determined at the operation, but to hospitalize her as soon as possible. Doctor was informed by her husband that they were not wards of the government. Doctor then suggested she be taken to Mendocino County Hospital. Mrs. Stilwell was taken to Mendocino County Hospital run by Dr. Cleveland. She was there about one week with ice bags on her abdomen, but her condition steadily grew worse. According to her husband, on June 3rd, Mr. Stilwell came to this office requesting aid from the government in the way of service, a change of hospital, an operation to save his wife's life. The books here did not show Mrs. Stilwell as a federal ward. I called Dr. Abbott on the telephone to determine what his diagnosis had been at the time he had seen her. Learning his diagnosis and his opinion of the treatment she had received for her ailment, I telephoned you asking what your pleasure was in this case. While I talked to you, one of your clerks slipped up her wardship, and you gave me permission to hospitalize Mrs. Still Stillwell as a ward. I now called Dr. Cleland at his office and at his home, but was unable to catch him, neither was he at the hospital. 
Mr. Stilwell went to the hospital and got his wife, taking her to Willits Hospital, where on her arrival she was immediately operated on, findings being ruptured pus tubes with general diffused peritonitis. The patient had a stormy time until June night when she passed away. As you are aware, I never had any of the Indians in the Mendocino County Hospital because of the cold-blooded methods used there. The Board of Supervisors have tried hard to rid the hospital of Dr. Cleland, but he seems firmly fixed there. This case is to try to show by grand jury investigation that Dr. Cleland failed to do his duty when it was so plainly marked, that is, operate on Mrs. Stilwell. Permission is asked for Dr. Badcock, Babcock and the operating surgeon and myself to give testimony before the grand jury. While I doubt this case will have any influence on the survivors, whichever way it goes due to the fact that the one involved is an Indian, because I am sure that there are, have been plenty of white people in the same boat as Mrs. Stilwell, and no investigation was held. I am of the opinion that Mary Clark is the moving spirit behind this investigation as they were relatives. In capital letters it says, rest assured, there is no involvement on the Indian service. Our skirts are clean, awaiting your wire. Yours rarely truly, G.T. Barklow. I have another document from the next day, United States Department of Interior. Field Service, Ukiah, California, June 22, 1937. Mr. Roy Nash. Regarding my telegram of today, my letter of June 21st on the Stillwell case, today I was obliged to go to Willits and I had a talk with Dr. Babcock on this case. It is his opinion that this grand jury is all a political setup and that nothing will come of anything that may be done by the grand jury. Ever since I have been here, there has been a wire, a write-up in the papers of the county hospital. The changes that are recommended each time is made by an attorney. He has visited around the county hospitals to get some sort of setup for this county hospital, but never has a physician been on any of the investigating committees. It is always lawyers. It seems to me that they went to, if they want to remove Cleland from the hospital, but they have nothing to put in his place. That is, in the opinion, however, those that are in the know seem to think that the idea is to replace him with a local doctor that is far from friendly to the Indian service. Since if the grand jury is sincere in wanting to better conditions at the hospital, it seems strange that they should pick this particular case since it involves an Indian when it would not be at all difficult to light on a white case. Again, the problem of medical ethics is involved here that won't help our cause out one bit. Recommended that the service be disinterested in any investigation of this kind. Yours truly, Barclow. That was my grandmother and my mother was the one who held those ice bags on her abdomen while my grandfather and my uncle held her arms and feet because the pain was so excruciating and all of the nursing staff and the doctor could say was to shut that Indian up. I have here the Treaty of 1851 um, under President Hillard Fillmore, 1850. They made rec treaty made and concluded at Camp Klamath at the junction of Klamath and Trinity Rivers, State of California, October 6, 1851, between Reddick McKee, Indian agent on the part of the United States, and the chiefs, captains, and head men of the Polick and Lower Klamath tribes of Indians. A treaty of peace and friendship made and concluded at Camp, Clam Camp Klamath at the junction of the Klamath and Trinity Rivers between Reddick McKee, one of the Indian agents specially appointed to make treaties with the various Indian tribes in California on the part of the United States and the chiefs, captains, and headmen of the tribes 
four bands of Indians now in council at this camp, representing the Polik and Lower Klamath and the Petsig or Upper Klamath and the Hoopaw or Trinity River Indians, containing also stipulations preliminary to future measures to be recommended for adoption on the part of the United States. Article 1. The said tribes or bands acknowledge themselves jointly and severely under the exclusive jurisdiction, authority, and protection of the United States and hereby bind themselves to refrain from the commission of all acts of hostility or aggression towards the government or citizens thereof and to live on terms of peace and friendship among themselves and with all other Indian tribes which are now or may hereafter come under the protection of the United States. Article 2. Lest the peace and friendship established between the United States and the said tribes should be interrupted by the misconduct of individuals, it is expressly agreed that for injuries received on either side, no private revenge or retaliation shall make shall take the place or be attempted. But instead thereof, complaints shall be made by the party aggrieved to the other through the Indian agent of the United States in their district, whose duty it shall be to investigate and, if practical, adjust the difficulty or in case of acts of violence being committed upon persons or property of a citizen of the United States by an Indian or Indians belonging to or harbored by either of said tribes or bands, the party or parties charged with the commission of the crime shall be promptly delivered up when demanded to the civil authorities of the United States of California for trial. And in case the crime has been committed by a citizen or citizens of the United States upon a person or property of an Indian or Indians of either said tribes, the agent shall take all proper measures to bring the offenders to trial in the same way. Article 3. The said tribes or bands hereby jointly and severely relinquish, cede, and forever quit claim to the United States all their right, title, claim, or interest to any kind which they either of them have to lands or soil in California. Article 4. To promote the settlement and improvement of said tribes, the bands it is hereby stipulated and agreed upon that on the part of the United States that the following tract or district of land shall be appropriated and set apart as an Indian reservation and the use and the possession of thereof forever granted to said tribes, their successors, and to such other tribes as the United States may hereafter remove from other parts of the valleys to the Trinity or of Klamath River or the county adjacent and settle thereupon to wit commencing at the north at the mouth of the stream called Johns Creek emptying into Trinity River on the north side thereof about 14 miles above this camp thence running up the middle of the same with its windings to a distance of five miles thence north to the summit of, of the dividing ridge between the waters of the Trinity and Klamath rivers, thence northwesterly in a straight line to a point said beyond the Klamath River, thence southwardly along the summit of said ridge to a point due north to the mouth of Pine Creek, thence north to said place of beginning. The said river reservations including by estimation, a 20 mile in length by 12 miles in width, and containing in all six or seven square miles of farming land. It is, however, understood and agreed that the United States reserves the right of way over said lands and of, use, and of using for farming purposes any quantity thereof not exceeding 1,000 acres. Also the right to establish such military posts, erect such buildings, and make such improvements for the accommodations of their agents and other officers or servants as the President may direct. Also that said tribes or bands 
shall never sell or alienate their right to claim to any of thereof except to the United States, nor shall they ever lease or permit white men to settle, work, or trade upon any part thereof without the written permission of the United States Indian agent of the district. Article 5. It is further stipulated and agreed that the said tribes of bands shall within three years from the date thereof or sooner, if therefore acquired by the United States, remove to and settle upon said reservation, and that whenever said removal and settlement shall be ordered by the United States or made by said tribes, such farmers, mechanics, and school teachers, to instruct them in the language, arts, and agriculture of the whites as the President may deem expedient and proper, shall be assigned, provided for, and settled among them so as to place the Indians on said reservation in a situation as favorable for their improvement, being in like manner supplied with facilities for farming, stock raising, etc., as by the Treaty of the Lupi U Ma on the 20th day of August 51, it is stipulated to be assigned to and provided for the Clear Lake Indians. It is understood, however, that if upon examination by the Indian agent, it is found that any of the articles or supplies provided in said treaty for the Clear Lake Indians shall be unnecessary for or unsuited to the Indians on the Trinity and Klamath, the President may in his discretion withhold the same and invest the value thereof in other and more suitable goods, and it is further expressly agreed and understood that if either of said tribe bands or other Indians harbored by them shall be guilty of theft, robbery, or murder, either upon persons or property of Indians or whites, the United States may exclude such tribes from all Indian benefits of this treaty. Article 6. As early as convenient after the ratification of this treaty by the President and the Senate of the United States will deliver to the said Klamath and Trinity Indians through their agent during each of the years of 1852 and 1853. 500 pairs, two and a half point Mackinac blankets, 500 pairs strong cotton pantaloons, 500 cotton hickory shirts, 500 red flannel shirts, 500 strong cotton or linsey gowns, 300 yards of calico, 300 yards of four force brown sheeting, 30 pounds scotch thread, 500 needles, six dozen pair of scissors, two gross thimbles, ten pounds of pins, ten dozen nine-inch flat files, thirty-five dozen large butcher knives, ten maddox, one hundred garden or corn hoes, two hundred chopping axes handled common size, two hundred chopping axles handled small size, one hundred sheet iron camp kettles large size, 100 sheet iron camp stout kettles, second size. It is understood, however, that the agent shall use a sound discretion as to the time when and the tribes or persons to whom the said goods shall be distributed, having reference to their peaceful disposition and good conduct. Article 7. In consideration of the premise, the United States is in, in addition to the numerous presents, beef, bread, sugar, blankets, shirts, etc., made to the tribes at this camp, will within 60 days from the date thereof furnish them free of charge at the ferry of C.W. Durkee and Klamath River, to enable them to rebuild their houses recently destroyed by the whites, with four dozen chopping axes handled, ten sacks of hard bread, four bullocks, 16 pairs of heavy blankets to be distributed among them by said Durkee according to their respective losses. Article 8. 
These articles to be binding upon the contracting parties when ratified by the President and the Senate of the United States in testimony whereof the parties here hereunto signed their names and affixed their seals this 60 day of October Anno Domini 1851 Reddick McKee United States Interior Indian Agent for California for and in behalf of the Witchpeck tribe living at the mouth of the Trinity Wak Uv Gra his X mark Wapi Shaw his X mark Salsal Mitch his X mark Aqua his X mark for in behalf of the Wu Si tribe living three miles below the Trinity Wa Ru Muk his X mark for in behalf of Kapel tribe Ma An his X mark Wu Sir his X mark U Per Gash his X mark and it goes on all the Native Americans signed with an X mark and uh, I believe that none of them could actually understand because it's hard for me with an actual high school education to be able to understand some of the writings and uh, it was all interpreted to them by uh, John McKee and uh, C.W. Durkee uh, most of the uh, uh, things that were to be distributed for instance the 500 cotton shirts there were over 3,000 Native Americans on the reservation uh, and uh, McKee and Durkee had oversee over who actually gets the items in particular Governor Schwarzenegger recently signed a uh, uh, document allowing the big four tribes of Southern California to increase their casino size and increase their income from $120,000 a month for each man, woman, and child of that tribe. The small tribes amount, some of them, to only 30 people in the tribe, and now their income is over $300,000 a month while the non-gaming Native Americans receive absolutely nothing. My aunt, one of my mother's brother's uh, wives, recently fell and has injured herself and is currently in, in need of an operation, and she uh, can't get any funding from the federal government or from the Gaming Commission, either one. My great-grandmother, who was my mother's best friend until she died on the reservation at age 15, uh, was a sole survivor of one of those massacres. Her name was Secura until she was taken to the reservation where her name was changed to Emma Smith. 